Good afternoon and good evening to all. I'm really excited to present today our panel themes and speakers today. Um, I'm delighted that you can join us. My name is Karina Kielman. I'm an associate professor in the Institute for Global Health and Development at Queen Margaret University uh, in Edinburgh. My co-chair is Haley McGregor, who's a medical doctor and an anthropologist, currently research fellow at the Institute of Development Studies, University of Sussex. Uh, as co-chairs and friends, we share a combined background in anthropology and the health sciences, um, but also a very long-standing conversation about the possibilities and the limitations of using ethnographic approaches in um, health systems research, particularly in that space of the clinic. So the clinic as both a physical site as well as a primary vehicle for delivery of healthcare presents, I think, a domain of unique interest for health systems researchers. Clinics are distinctive fields of study. They're simultaneously bounded areas with specific spatial and temporal orders, codes of conduct and standardized rules, but at the same time, they're permeable units influenced by broader external ideological, systemic and policy shifts. In recent years, we've seen a lot of interest in using clinic-based ethnography and ethnographic methods to understand how interventions can be or are being currently implemented in real life healthcare delivery systems. Often, however, research on clinic utilization, access, uptake, or that facility readiness to implement interventions has tended to isolate specific components of care. For example, in looking at this image from a clinic providing TB care in South Africa, um, a rapid and direct observation um, of, of the scene might readily capture basic visible manifestations and processes associated with treatment. However, these systems, um, these elements of systems protocol and process are not delivered on a blank slate. So a next layer of research might start to uncover what they mean in the context of how care is organized and delivered. The attention then might shift to using interviews, for example, to examine prescribed roles, relationships, interactions between patients and provider. Yet often in many cases, these are still being considered as discrete phenomena. If, however, we were able to spend more time in the setting, you might start to see the clinic through a whole systems lens and one with a focus on deeper meanings of specific elements and processes in context, as well as the dynamic interactions across social material and technical elements of care across the working life of the clinic. As applied to clinics, a whole systems approach demands both theoretical attention and methodological depth. Conducting ethnographic research in clinics can allow for more formalized surface level data collection to be grounded in observations, stories, impromptu notes, intuitive insights in what is really going on. And that in turn allows for a deeper understanding of how the rationalities, the authoritative knowledge, the embodied experience of care might be shaped through everyday work practices and institutional culture. Our panel today explores the potential for clinic-based ethnography to appeal or to, to provide this perspective, a whole systems perspective on critical health policy and systems research questions. But at the same time, we are attentive to the practical challenges and the ethical and moral dilemmas that arise in the conduct of this kind of research and its dissemination. The session brings together individuals with experience, passion and expertise in the application of ethnographic methods to health policy and systems research. We'll be first hearing from Priya Das and Karima Khalil. We'll be speaking about their health, uh, their work on maternal health in India. Priya is a senior consultant at Oxford Policy Management in New Delhi and leads their work on health systems, software and gender. Karima is also a senior consultant with OPM India and a public health physician whose areas of interest are maternal and neonatal health and quality of care. We'll then hear from Brechia de Kock who will be drawing also on her insights from work on maternal health to address issues of conflicting accountabilities. Brechia is an interdisciplinary social scientist and an assistant professor at the University of Amsterdam, where she's member of the Health, Care and Body Research Group. We'll then have a paper that looks at Haley's and my experience of using ethnographic methods to understand whole systems influences on infection prevention control for tuberculosis in South Africa. Finally, Virginia Bond, will present on her and Janet Seeley's work uh, 
on spatial mapping of HIV-related stigma in Zambia and South Africa. Virginia is a social anthropologist whose areas of interest include public health, HIV, TB, health-related stigma, and urban systems methodology. She works for the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and is based at Zambart in Zambia. Janet Seeley is Professor of Anthropology and Health at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Following these four presentations, Haley uh, will then take a few clarification questions for our speakers, and then we're going to hand over to Janet, who will facilitate a discussion of cross-cutting issues. We really want to encourage you to reflect with us on the challenges and the opportunities for conducting and presenting results from ethnographic work in health policy and systems research. Please use the Q&A function to put your specific questions to speakers, as well as any comments um, that you might want to share with us. Kelly and I will be keeping an eye on this. We're very aware that there's very limited time for discussion, so please do email us for any further thoughts. We'll be thrilled to hear from you. And now I'd like to turn over um, the mic to, Ka uh, to, to Priya Das, please. I would just put up my okay. That's good, Priya. Great, thank you. So good evening, and I'm very glad um, to present the a study that we've done in the eastern state of India. It's called Understanding the Whys of Facility Ethnography along with my colleague on this presentation, um, Dr. Karima Khalil. Um, so very briefly, we'll go through um, the background of the study, the study objectives, methods, and key findings. Um, in terms of the background, our study was focused, uh, uh, it was a focused ethnography of two primary level health facilities, which was part of a larger evaluation of a donor-supported health system strengthening initiative. Um, and what we found that the larger evaluation showed that the no do gaps persisted amongst nurses and managers who had received technical and managerial capacity building as part of the strengthening initiative. Um, the main objective of our study was to really understand why knowledge levels, that is knowing what to do, was not matched by similar levels of correct practices, that is doing what is known, what we eventually constructed as the no-do gaps. Um, in order to really unpack this why, uh, we kind of took a whole of system approach, trying to understand the interconnected interactions of the different components and the actors with a specific emphasis on looking at the intangible um, software of the health system, meaning power, relational dynamics, values, norms, et cetera, usually unwritten scripts that actually underpin provider behavior and practice. Um, in a sense, the research was designed to capture how formal organizational structures, incentives, management procedures interacted with informal structures, behaviors, and relationships on the ground. In terms of the um, study site and method, uh, two rural primary healthcare centers were uh, sort of purposively selected in two districts within the uh, state. And we had two different teams collecting data on uh, data in both the sites. The team comprised of nurse researchers, social scientists, and people with background in hospital management. The field, works work, field work was conducted over five cycles. Each cycle varied between three to five week duration with the field team spending almost six to eight hours daily at the facility five days a week. Uh, we had built in in-between time. So in the intervals, we kind of uh, built in for, de uh, for debriefing, initial data analysis, incremental knowledge building, team discussions and reflection and planning. So we use these two to three weeks gap between field works, to really plan and learn for the next stage. Uh, we developed a range of tools around, I think, 24 to capture all aspects of the facility functioning using methods like uh, IDI shadowing, unstructured conversations, direct observation, and a whole lot of um, other tools. In total, all staff cadres were interviewed and or observed multiple times. We had 85 interviews in facility A with 35 respondents, and we had 75 uh, interviews uh, in facility B with 34 um, respondents. Um, 
to move on to the key findings. Um, today we are sharing like broad findings of why the clinical no-do gaps exist amongst nurses. This provides a broad list of the different clinical sort of practices on which the nurses had been trained on. And we found that uh, the protocols were not being followed, even, if the, even when the nurses had the knowledge of how these clinical uh, practices needed to be done. So this illustration brings together the different factors and issues we identified contributing to the provider no-do gaps. Uh, broadly, what we found that the clinical no-do gaps were not just an issue of learning, training, and individual behavior, which was essentially the brief with which we went into this whole uh, learning exercise. We were asked as to how can we change individual behavior such that they are able to sustain the knowledge they get and actually put it into practice. What we learned instead was that besides system hardware deficiency, the no-do gap was an outcome of certain assumptions that the intervention had made around the suitability of the intervention to the context, the facility supervision and management of the capacity building model itself, the gendered position and capacities of the nurses within the facilities, and most importantly, the lack of acknowledgement of the positions of the nurses in the system in the facilities and the power struggles amongst nurses and between the nurses and the management. So all of these, uh, all of these sort of three or four issues around accountability, power struggles manifested in what we are seeing in this illustrations as the different components that actually kind of underpinned most of the no-do gaps. Uh, just to give you a, a snippet of the sort of the two core areas that emerged uh, sort of strongly in our, uh, in our study. One was what they call the practical concerns around doing what they knew. And um, the basically one, the key sort of, it, it was kind of cyclical in nature. For example, shortage of human resources led to unrealistic workloads as can be seen in these quotes here, making the following of the protocols that required extra time completely impossible. Also, new knowledge and practice had become a source of power and currency for the in-facility nurse mentors who were supposed to train the other nurses to create greater importance in the overall marginalized positions of the nurses within the facilities. Hence, the transfer of knowledge through the cascading model that the capacity building intervention had assumed didn't work. The in-facility mentors held on to the knowledge and created their own positions of importance rather than training other nurses. In addition to not willing to transfer knowledge, they lacked time because they were most skilled, most managers demanded on their time. So it became like a cyclical process. As a result, other nurses only assisted the nurse mentors but never got to practice. So when the mentors are not found around the then the, the clinical proce procedures are not followed. And you can see in the quotes where she's saying that it happens on Fridays and Wednesdays because the mentors are always away doing other, sort of attending to other clinical procedures in the facility. And the other aspect that came out that the labor room did not have any clinical supervision by the doctors. Primarily, they were all males. And in the Indian context, anyway, it's not um, very comfortable for male doctors to come in frequently into the labor room. And even if they could be called on, they were never available because they, were, they prioritized their private practice within the ecosystem of the facility during the clinic time. So given all of these realities on the ground, from the perspective of the nurses, they felt that what they do instead of the prescribed practices is what they see as realistic. Their main aim is to achieve a basic objective that the mother and child go alive from the hospital. They don't find the fine collaborated practices that they had been taught relevant for their purposes, especially given their constraints. And the second issue really was around the disempowered positions of the AM, which I've slightly sort of reflected upon. As you see, minutes, Priya. Okay. So, as the quotes here suggest, a large part of the nurses' no do gap was explained by the power dynamics and accountability vis a vis the nurses in the facility. AM's responsibility and the formal power is completely asymmetrical. 
the doctors misuse their position to put extra responsibility on the nurses and for and for work that they were not responsible for but were held accountable and punitively accountable so as a result of which they did not risk undertaking any clinical practices that they could go wrong with and therefore invite the ire of the management and overall there was complete lack of recognition of the extra effort and responsibility um they uh, sort of had to take on providing those clinical services considering they were initially only trained for outreach work <clears throat> with no career progressions etc they basically didn't find the incentive for the behavior change or didn't understand why taking on additional new practices uh, would really uh, make a difference to them or their positions within the facility so i'll just uh, stop there thank you Thank you so much, Priya. Um, we're going to be moving on to the presentation by Brecha de Kock. Thank you very much, Karina. And thank you so much for everybody who's here to make time in their busy schedules to listen to our presentations. Um, so today I want to talk about how clinic ethnography can contribute to systems and complexity thinking. And to do so, I'm going to draw on two recent studies of mine and colleagues on accountability for loss uh, in childbearing and respectful maternity care in Malawi. And I would like to acknowledge and thank my Malawian and other collaborators and co-authors. In 2013, me and colleagues uh, from Malawi set out to study loss in childbearing. We looked at different forms of loss, uh, including maternal deaths, but also miscarriages, stillbirths and neonatal deaths. And we used loss as a lens to examine accountability on the ground. This is important because as Friedman and Schaaf have uh, pointed out, accountability is often called for in health systems interventions, uh, but it also risks becoming an empty buzzword. It's important to ground accountability in local power relationships, and we felt that ethnographic methods would allow us to do so. We conducted interviews and focus group discussions with health providers and community members, including women who lost a baby, relatives of women who lost a baby and relatives of women who died and general community members. And we also conducted unstructured observations of care um, in uh, rural clinics and district health hospitals for approximately 13 weeks. We focused in the analysis on interpretations of loss and accountability for loss. Um, and we also sought to explore accountability mechanisms operating who holds whom accountable, for what and how exactly. And this was uh, meant to give us insight into how healthcare providers provide care, how women experience care, and ultimately how the health system functions. And to demonstrate the kind of insights we can gain from clinic ethnography, I want to share an ethnographic vignette. Chifundo is an 18 year old prima gravida. It's her first birth. I entered a small room of a rural, uh, of a labor room um, in a rural health center, two hours away on a very bumpy road from the nearest district hospital. It's 5.30 p.m. and I join her and the nurse. Tifunda is clearly in labor and in pain. She wriggles, she groans, she calls for her mother. The nurse asks her, does she have the strength? Has she eaten porridge? If she has the strength, there will be no problem. If she hasn't, she might need to call the ambulance to take her to the district hospital. At 6.30 p.m. there's no progress in her labor and the midwife calls in the guardians. The agogo, the grandmother, comes in and Chifundu's mother. They are informed by the nurse that Chifundu does not push enough. It goes like this. The nurse mimics the sounds of faint pushing. The guardians tell her that we did cook porridge for Chifundu. The agogo, the grandmother, gets angry. She jumps up and down, points her finger at Chifundu, slaps her thigh and tells her, if it's a stillbirth, that's the end of the marriage. Chifundo's mother asks the nurse to slap Chifundo. The nurse smiles and does nothing, but looks pitif pitiful at Chifundo. At 7 p.m., the nurse calls the ambulance. She turns to me and tells me that we're third in line. The single, district ava the single ambulance available for the district uh, is first going to two other places. Maybe by midnight they might come, the nurse tells me. At 10 p.m., the ambulance arrives two hours early, earlier than expected. The nurse says in Chichewa to Chifundo, she doesn't want to push, she wants to go to town, she wants to eat chips. 
This vignette shows how women like Tifundo can be held accountable by both midwives and their guardians, their relatives. In this case, complications, the prolonged labor, the lack of adequate pushing, were attributed to Tifundo's volition. Tifundo doesn't want to push, the midwife said. In this way, she is held responsible for the lack of progress in her labor. There are sanctions and threats thereof, of a divorce, of a slap. And I would argue that what we can see here is that the nurse uses or exploits existing organic accountability relationships between family members. And this leads to what now would be widely described as disrespect and abuse. But I want to put a question mark there. I don't want us to engage in midwives bashing. They too are held accountable by national and international stakeholders. In 2013, the end of the Millennium Development Goals were near and Malawi was not doing particularly well or not well enough in terms of reducing number of maternal deaths. This was an international but also a national political target as illustrated by billboards on the side of the road. The picture on the right hand side here shows the then president joins Banda declaring Uchimbere Wabwino or safe motherhood as part of the Malawi Watsopano, the new Malawi. I would argue that what we see is that the organic already existing forms of accountability converge with newly orchestrated specifically designed forms of accountability meant to make health systems function better. When they converge, they might trigger forms of disrespect and abuse. Others have also argued how emphasis on reaching numeric targets and upward accountability may displace attention and space for attention for quality and process. And the more recent attention for respectful maternity care and the rights of uh, childbearing women is probably creating new space again for process and quality. But I have some remaining critical questions. Um, my question is how useful is it to label behaviors as described as disrespect and abuse? And I think we can draw on some theoretical lenses here to deepen our understanding of the scenes and the behaviors involved. In particular, I would like to mobilize here the notion of logic as developed by Anne-Marie Moll and modes of ordering as developed by John Law. These notions are very similar to discourse, which people might be more familiar with. It's about patterns in practices and ways of talking. It's about actions, words and objects and how they obtain meaning within particular modes of ordering or logics. As Paul has said, what is true, just, valuable, rational or relevant in one mode of ordering is not necessarily valued in the same way in another. And what we could say is that respectful maternity care, rights-based, human rights-based respectful maternity care is one particular mode or logic. And within this lo logic, shouting becomes a form of disrespect and abuse. But I would argue that we can also see another mode or logic operating in the clinic, one which I call survival. In this mode, shouting becomes a form of caring for the life of the mother and the baby, even if not ideal. The nurses in our respectful maternity care study from 2016, where we also adopted an ethnographic approach, could well recite the rules and the guidelines of respectful maternity care. But they also said that sometimes they just had to shout at women in order to make them follow life-saving instructions. This analysis shows how we can adopt and foster systems and complexity thinking through clinic ethnography. It's about seeing how parts connect to a whole. It's about looking at the whole forest rather than individual trees. Clearly, the clinic is not an island and is permeable. When clients and their relatives enter the clinic, they bring with them a whole set of gender-based norms, power relationships and organic forms of accountability. System thinking is about seeing behavior as not emerging from individuals, but from interactions and relationships between components of the health system, including human and non-human actors. For the disrespect and abuse, uh, which we saw, the lack of the ambulance will have been key, as well as the involvement of the guardians. This was not just about an individual nurse's attitude or her cognition. System Thank thinking... Yeah, system thinking is also about feedback loops and acknowledging that there will be emergence and change and unexpected outcomes. And what we can see is that when health intervention insert new logics like respectful maternity care, there might be unexpected and important unexpected outcomes. What we noticed was that nurses did not only sometimes not see the point of not shouting, um, they also felt that the emphasis on women's rights was frustrating and led to unrealistic demands on behalf of women.
And what about their own rights, they, they wondered. And if it, midwives get become frustrated, it's likely that the relationships with women deteriorate. And that, after all, might actually reduce quality of care. So this is an important unexpected outcome to monitor, preferably, I would argue, through qualitative and ethnographic methods. So I hope to show in this short presentation how clinic ethnography can illuminate complexity and systems behavior. And it does so especially by its longer term engagement, unstructured open methods and serendipity. I never planned to observe Tifuno's case, which was so important for the development of my thinking. I just spent as much time as I could with my Malamian colleague in the clinic in the morning, afternoon, evening and sometimes nights. But I also want to draw our attention to the fact that anthropology as a discipline has more to, to offer than methods. There's also a whole theoretical toolkit there. And I think that they can serve as useful lenses which make us see what we neglected before. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Berge. Um, stimulating presentation. And now we're going to move on to Haley. Apologies, I had an internet <laughs> slow down there. Um, I'm thinking of the art um, clinic ethnography related to a study to improve infection prevention and control for tuberculosis in South Africa. And this is called um, Umoyo Emuchle, which is Isuzulu for good air. I'm just struggling to advance my slide. My oh goodness, I'm very sorry. Ah, there we go, it's working now. So in um, Omoyo Mukhle, we, um, we're moving beyond conventional approaches to understanding clinic transmission of tuberculosis, which focus very much on technical interventions, for example, to improve ventilation in clinics and on personal protective equipment. We were trying to take a whole systems approach to understanding the implementation of IPC methods and particularly looking at the reduction of transmission of clinic based on nosocomial TB in South Africa. South Africa has a very high level of endemic tuberculosis, tuberculosis related also to a high prevalence of HIV and a lot of concern about drug resistant um, tuberculosis and particularly the transmission in community-based clinics. Our starting premise was that assessing the infrastructure of infection prevention and control for TB required attention to both systems elements for the support of the delivery of services, but also the software elements of systems related to social relations, power relations, and the circulation of knowledge about IPC. And in this regard, we were borrowing a theoretical lens from anthropology, which considered infrastructure to, to be comprised of both social and material dimensions. So conventional infection prevention and control gives attention to the three bulleted areas there. So on the one hand, there's material infrastructure, the clinic buildings, um, windows, speech and boost, air extraction systems and so forth. Then there's also attention to a uh, mask wearing, both on the part of staff, but also making masks available for people entering the clinics. And we're all very familiar now with these kinds of measures from um, COVID-19. But today I'm particularly going to focus on that last bullet, which is the issue of patient congregation and flow. And this relates to um, evidence that where you have a lot of people crowded closely together in spaces that are poorly ventilated, there's an increased transmission of um, tuberculosis. 
flow here refers to the movement of people within a clinic space. And obviously, if you can regulate flow, you can reduce that close congregation or crowding. With respect to congregation and flow, we were particularly interested in those three dimensions, design and the use of space, various administrative logistics in the clinics, and finally, the organization of care. And I'll be paying attention to those three elements. So how did we go about exploring congregation and flow methodologically? Omoyo Mukhle is an interdisciplinary um, project. Um, there's several anthropologists involved. We had a, a, a work package that focused on the policy priorities for TB and um, HIV care. But um, we were also um, quite interested in various quantitative methods. And my colleague Sanj Karat um, did the measurement of waiting times and overcrowding in different clinic spaces over the course of the day, finding that on average people were waiting for up to four hours and that during the early part of the day there was more crowding and that women with children spend, um, spent the longest amounts of times in clinics. My colleague Tom Yates did ventilation measurements that showed that air exchange was particularly um, slow in small spaces that were poorly um, ventilated. And this, of course, would also increase the transmission of tuberculosis in those spaces. We were also interested in, in determining the normative clinical pathways for TB care and comparing those to patient pathways and the sort of spatial and temporal features of how people were actually using the space in the clinic and moving through, through the clinic and indeed comparing clinical and patient pathways. And um, with respect to our ethnographic methods, which involved um, observation, informal conversation and interviews, we were particularly interested in elucidating the, the sort of disjunctures between the ideal intentions around implementing IPC measures and the realities, what were actually being done, what was actually happening in the clinics, and then asking the question what the implications were for achieving better infection prevention and control in those clinics. So I'm going to um, now go through those three um, elements of congregation and flow and present some of our ethnographic data and what it elucidated in the study. So first of all, clinic design and the use of space. We spoke to various um, people in the clinic and beyond um, to try and get, get the different perspectives on the use in space. So we, we focused um, on built environment specialists, um, architects and engineers, and they um, gave an account of really having to manage trade-offs as they designed clinic spaces or try to introduce retrofits. So on the one hand, there was infection prevention and control, the placement of windows, how wide the corridors were and so forth, but there were other concerns such as security or the functionality of the space that they had to trade off. Often they expressed a desire for more bottom-up um, processes whereby they could also have some contact with staff and patients and have some sense of how space was actually being used. With respect to healthcare workers, um, they had very functional and pragmatic needs that they put forward with respect to the use of space that were sometimes at odds with some of the design elements around um, IPC. They also complained that complicated bureaucracy made it very difficult to achieve structural changes in clinics that would improve ventilation or other elements of infection prevention. The patients had an experience whereby um, bottlenecks and crowding of people would emerge in areas that were not designed um, for waiting, such as the vital signs room. And I'll just take you through two illustrations here of this. On the one hand, we got a lot of accounts of how the design intentions for the clinic space to improve ventilation in particular were at odds with practicalities such as temperature control or indeed um, needs for privacy when the windows were placed too low. We also, through our observations, saw um, illustrations of where clinic buildings that had been designed, particularly with big central waiting areas, such as the picture at the top right hand side, this particular clinic had the state of the art stack ventilation system, but in fact, people were crowding in a narrow corridor outside the vital signs room because they were too afraid um, to move away in case they didn't hear their name being called and they went to the, the back of a long queue. So in terms of the administrative logistics, there's several elements that come to mind. 
there was a system of trying to introduce appointments across the day to spread the flow of patients, but these faced practical challenges such as the lack of transport um, to the clinic across the day. The um, clinic infrastructure didn't always enable new ways of working. For example, there were unintended consequences of a new file retrieval um, system. And then it was really clear from our observations that there were no formal measures for queue management. This task was often informally allocated to the security guards. There were no measures such as ticketing or, or electronic numbering systems. Haley, two minutes. So here we see how these new ways of working created unintended crowding, for example, with a, with a new file retrieval system that extending waiting times and the lack of appointment systems led to the crowding of patients at the beginning of the day. So finally, just to turn to the organization of, of care, while we were doing this work, there was a new framework called the Ideal Clinic that was being introduced. Um, what we saw was that in fact, patients very much followed the clinical clinic pathway um, in the clinic. They were very afraid to move around because of the lack of queue management um, systems. They were afraid to miss their place. So one had this congregation in narrow corridors. We also saw that TB care was often put in a separate section of the clinic and the spatial segregation was based on assumptions of risk from particular patients but didn't address the broader risk from undiagnosed TB that was inadequately addressed by TB triage. What we really saw was that there was a very strong interrelationship between material and social infrastructure so that new policy changes and ways of working such as through the ideal clinic were not possible to implement because of the, the sort of structural challenges of old clinic buildings that couldn't be um, changed. And this really led to us identifying through this ethnographic work particular synergies or leverage points related to existing policy changes to improve the quality of care through appointment systems and reduced waiting times. And these sort of policy leverage points provided opportunities potentially to also harness gains for infection prevention of control through shifts in the organization of care or improvements in administrative logistics. But on the other, on the other hand, there were also these unintended consequences, including of these new ways of working, particularly related to structural problems with clinic buildings that couldn't be addressed. So finally, our ethnographic methods really allowed this exploration of both the social and material elements of clinic infrastructures. It enabled analysis of these unexpected um, things that came to the fore with the unintended consequences of ways of working. It underscored why certain measures for infection prevention control were less effective and it surfaged leverage points that um, could be particularly related to organization of care and, and organizational culture in clinics um, and linking it also to the wider goals of, of health policy um, at the time. So um, just to acknowledge our other members of the Omoya Omukhle team. Thank you very much, Haley. Um, just encourage our attendees to post any questions they have for speakers. We're now moving to the last presentation um, by Ginny Bond. Go ahead, Ginny. Thank you. Um, so this presentation is also looking at organization of clinic space in, in Africa, but in Zambia and South Africa. And um, the research was responding to a trend um, that we see in Africa where HIV programs um, often make changes in health facility structure and processes. And um, people living with HIV sometimes um, are worried about being seen at the clinic by other people. So, we wanted to explore the relationship between health facility space and HIV stigma. I'm just gonna... um, so this research was linked to a mixed method study that was nested within a community randomized trial and HIV prevention in 21 urban communities in Zambia 12 and 9 in South Africa in Cape Town and it was responding to not only our own observations but other HIV literature that reflected this fear of being seen by others accessing HIV services 
Um, most of this literature had focused more on the relationships between providers and clients and less on the relationship between the physical environment and clients. Um, the exception to this is um, two ethnographic um, papers um, that were, one was on experiences in a prison in California where a, a, a woman who was an inmate um, who was acutely ill with HIV really struggled to access HIV services because of the physical um, access limitations and um, organization. And the other was um, in Tanzania, looking at how a sort of HIV services in, an, in a Tanzanian hospital were very um, new and well-organized and up-to-date. And this contrasted very much with the old bits of the hospital for other conditions. And is these two ethnographies use the concepts of place and space. And we have drew on, on this to organize and analyze our own data. So place being the physical environment that also represents um, values and qualities of society. And space being more about ideas about efficiency, flexibility and organization, which can be globally, global ideas that are then imposed and carried into that space with clients and health workers and with particular health conditions. So Sullivan actually argues that ethnography allows us to look at this conversion of global forms um, when they come into contact with more physical, local environments. So for this research, we um, had a sequence of um, activities that we carried out and we had three different tools. But for this presentation, I'm gonna focus more on the mapping that we did of the clinic layouts. So we did this research in 21 health facilities um, in South Africa and Zambia. And the first thing we did was to interview um, health facility workers and community health workers on average about three from each facility. And the first thing we did in the interviews was to use a map that was either drawn by a social scientist or general already present at the health facility to ask the participants to use crayons to color in where in their experience people living with HIV felt uncomfortable or comfortable, where people living with HIV were talked badly about and where people accessed HIV testing. Um, and then we use that map to then plan observations, which we carried out just one day in each facility, um, sort of spending time in each of the spaces that we heard within the clinic, where, where we heard people living with HIV um, sort of move through as part of the HIV client flow system in the different health facilities. Um, and then we subsequently did more in-depth interviews um, on HIV stigma experiences. So just to focus more on our use of the maps and how we analyze the maps, because we ended up with 68 maps from the 21 health facilities um, from health workers, either health facility workers or community health workers. Um, so the first step that we did was to ask the social scientists who collected that particular data to, um, in an analysis workshop, we looked together at the facility and asked them to explain the facility and the maps and the interviews that accompany the maps in some detail. Then a smaller group of us then sort of extracted um, that information initially into an Excel sheet um, where where we looked at um, that, we, first of all, we looked at what people said about particular spaces. And then we again looked at the, did another matrix where we looked according to each space, we summarized what everyone said about each space and, and sort of added up whether overall this place, let's say it was a VCT room was considered more comfortable, or uncomfortable or a mixture of each. And then eventually we ended up with a generic map for each country. 
So this is the map of the South African clinic. So this represents um, many different maps from nine different health facilities. Um, so overall, what we saw, so purple represents where people felt both comfortable and uncomfortable. And to explain that a bit more, just to give one example. So in an ARV waiting area, people feel comfortable because it's where they can see other people living with HIV, where they get specialized services um, and specialized health workers and, and where they also can access some private space once they move from there. They also feel uncomfortable because e they can sometimes easily be seen by others waiting there and then be labeled as living with HIV. The blue represents where people feel comfortable. So they feel comfortable in the general pharmacy because everybody is getting drugs from the general pharmacy. And it could be people with high blood pressure. It could be people with HIV. So they're not sort of pulled out as people living with HIV. And the reception is where you can get HIV testing. So to look at a map of the Zambian clinic, what we see here is where people feel both comfortable and uncomfortable and comfortable, but also where people feel uncomfortable, um, only uncomfortable. So the green, so for example, the pharmacy, and this is the pharmacy, the main pharmacy, not the pharmacy specific to the art clinic. In Zambia, overall, people felt that people living with HIV didn't like being seen at the main pharmacy because they were given ARVs in particular boxes, which distinguished them as living with HIV. And the red represents where people are talked badly about, which is only sort of toilets. So just to sort of think, well, we you know how did doing these maps sort of contribute to ethnography and contribute to our findings? So what we saw was this sort of discord around demarcation of HIV space. On the one hand, it was a good thing. On the other hand, it wasn't. And the reasons for that. We also were able to piece together um, the HIV client flow system in Zambia and South Africa. And we included that in an analysis um, from looking at the physical layout of the clinics using the maps. And using the maps, we were also able to ask participants how certain items triggered visibility of people living with HIV. So for example, this quote illustrates um, that, that they, people living with HIV, will hesitate to go to the art clinic and they will look in the direction of the outpatients department to see if there's no one there seeing them. That is when they will go to the art clinic and sometimes they're at the art pharmacy area, they might feel uncomfortable. And so it's just all these associations between the sort of physical space and people's assumptions about you being in that particular space. And we also saw finally that that in some health facilities that staff and people living with HIV would make adjustments to space and to items to diminish the risk of being identified as people living with HIV in these spaces. And the example here is about art adherence clubs in South Africa, which minimize the amount of time that people spend and minimize at the clinic, it, minim it, it also means that they go directly to get ARVs pre-packed. And in this case, they were pre-packed in brown paper bags, which was less distinguishing. So that was one way of circumventing stigma um, through making changes to spatial organization and items. So I'd just like to acknowledge um, the researchers that we did this analysis with, particularly Sanazo Nomsenge, Monde Mwamba and Daniel Zeba, who worked very closely on this analysis with us. And also just to thank the research communities and participants and the HPTN study team and the funders NIMH. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jenny. Um, I think the fascinating um, thing that seems to be highlighted across the presentations is the issue of space, but I'm going to hand over to Haley, um, who can pick up any questions that our attendees have. I can't see much on the Q&A forum, but I would welcome um, people to join in the discussion now. We do have uh, I was just going minutes. to encourage people, so if you go back onto your on-air 
platform. On the right hand side, there's a downward arrow that says Q&A. So please do type in questions or comments and I can read them out. But at the moment, there isn't anything. I think people are just digesting the presentation. So maybe we should move on to Janet and then I'll keep monitoring that. Karina. Thank you, Hayley. So hopefully there'll be lots of um, questions coming in shortly. And I think one of one of the things, um, Karina raised the issue of space, but I think I, I wonder if we could just think a little about sharing the space with a researcher, sharing the space with someone who is observing you. And I think um, Priya, you had some observations around your team um, observing, documenting power struggles within the clinic. Could you perhaps reflect a little bit about what that, um, the feedback you got from them on how they managed that? Were they drawn into being seen as part of the way to resolve a dispute perhaps, or were they seen as, as removed from what was going on in the clinic? Do unmute. Karima, do you want to take on that question? Karima, do you want to unmute? Sorry. Go, go ahead, Priya. You take that right. one. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so it, it, it actually evolved over, like I mentioned, we had five cycles, actually a little bit more than five cycles of fieldwork. So it took a while for that trust um, to kind of build up. Um, initially, of course, there was a lot of trying to hide away from the researchers when unpleasant things were happening, when, when you know, the, the, the tussle between the managers and the nurses, etc., were going on. But I think by the second cycle of the fieldwork towards the end, they were, they were seen very much as part of the staff. And so they would get I myself have got put into uh, certain situations where I could clearly see what was happening because they would start sort of talking um, to each other through me. So similarly for the, for the researchers as well. And uh, what was very interesting is I went in two cycles after my field team really started working. And I could also clearly see that the field team had become them and I had become her. And so, you know, so it was, it, it evolved over a period of time, but actually it was that close proximity and everyday interaction in the labor room and in the nurse rooms um, that made these power struggles quite apparent because nobody talked about power using that word. But in, in, in for, for instance, very simply when the ward boy would come in ask, demanding something in the labor room space, he would turn to the researcher and say, just because he's a man, even if he's a ward boy, he can come and tell us of that is our position and you know, that's how we are treated. So yeah, so they very much kind of it became very much part and parcel of their everyday engagements and interaction um, after the, like towards the end of the second cycle, but it did take time to build that kind of trust and understanding. And I think this brings us to one of the points that Brekia had um, raised was over um, slow ethnography. And I think one of the things that your work so powerfully demonstrated was the value of taking time and being there at crucial points. I think one thing perhaps you can tell us before you respond on this is what was the outcome of that birth? Because I think we're all anxious to know. But also um, in terms of reflecting on doing slow ethnography and managing a situation where one is definitely not local. Um, how, how can you reflect perhaps on your own positionality in that ethnography? Yes, thank you, Janet. Um, it's interesting, the, the outcome of that birth is actually often asked about, uh, also when I present it to students, for instance. Um, I have no idea, and in fact, I know that the, the midwife uh, would also most likely not have had an idea of what happened exactly, unless maybe the, if the woman had died, she, she would have heard, I think. But uh, this was something, uh, the practitioners also sometimes would say to me, that this is something they found frustrating, that especially the practitioners working in health centers, because they felt there was no feedback in terms of what happens with those, those women we, we passed on. Um, so yeah, I don't know about that one. Um, yeah, importance of slow research and positionality. So obviously, you know, being a, a white Dutch woman, uh, clearly being a foreigner, um, 
it's it's very tricky to to do this kind of research and i think also that our and certainly my ideas about how to go about it have also changed over time so this is it's been quite interesting for me recently to reflect on okay what i did then i would um the, the grants i got i have to say were, were very small so uh, i didn't have much opportunities there to really um, draw more on Malawian research capacity on a more equal footing still than I did. I mean, I, obviously I did work together with, uh, with others, but um, yeah, there was still definitely a, a difference there in terms of how much input I could get from them just because of funding issues as well. Um, when you're an outsider, you definitely obviously need more time. In my case, um, uh, I had spent uh, regular moments uh, in uh, Malawi since 1999, so for a long time, uh, and was always, you know, very sort of embedded in local structures, if you like. So I, I would always stay with a local Malawian friend who is a sort of average middle class woman, a grandmother of children. Uh, I would live uh, with her or with her family in a rural village. Uh, so in that sense, it wasn't like I was sort of flying in and flying out. Um, but this is, yeah, it's the, the, the role we have as um, foreigners uh, is, is, is a very tricky one in terms of, you know, uh, what, 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 yeah, what, what are we to do in these days? Um, you know, I've, I've really enjoyed uh, thinking with uh, Saya Abimbola's uh, article about the foreign gaze, which some people might know in the BMJ Global Health. Uh, and, he, and he raises some very pertinent questions. Um, but at the same time, I also feel that, you know, as an outsider, you sometimes also can get access where others cannot, uh, and you can get answers to questions, you can ask questions which uh, others maybe can't. Um, so yeah, th there are pros and cons there, I think. I'll leave it there before, but I hope that others maybe want to jump in and, and because I would love to hear also from people who are joining us, like what their thoughts are about, you know, the positionality and the foreign gaze. So. Haley, do we have any questions yet? We don't actually, Janice, the, um, despite my encouraging post. Haley, we do actually. We've got a question from Alex Shankland. Okay, I can't see that. So you, you must, okay, the last one I can see is the one I posted. So why don't you read it, Karina? Mine obviously sure. hasn't been flashed. Yeah. Okay, so Alex is, is saying um, he liked the presentations, given the interesting insights shared on spatial organization, built environment dimensions of clinics, and what we know about power relations, class, race, gender, hierarchies that are embedded in these, could the presenters comment on whether they observe any variations across clinical contexts, so urban, peri-urban, informal settlement, more accessible rural, etc in the scope for adapting the physical setting, decoration, client flow, signposting in ways that, that might reflect a more inclusive approach. Um, so yeah, I, was, I, I think in a way, Haley, I don't know whether you wanted to comment on, on some of the things that we've been looking at in, in the, you know, the variation that we're seeing in those clinics in South Africa, um, just thinking about the newer clinics and the way they were designed as compared to some of the older clinics in in, in KwaZulu Natal, because um, there's yeah, I mean, I think those kinds of considerations come in. Yeah, I mean, I think um, in the South African context, they, there's so many potential. We can't hear you. Sorry. In the South African context, there are going to be so many axes of of inequality. So. Still so can't. We, we can hear Karina, so yeah. Can you hear? Yeah, you should be able to hear. Yeah, I can hear her. Yeah. I can hear her. Yeah, I, was, I was just commenting, Karina was, I mean, they in, in the South African context, there's so many axes of inequality, so Alex is asking the right question. So there was, in our study, there was this provincial difference in that the Western Cape, um, we had two sites in the Western Cape and in KwaZulu-Natal and the Western Cape, historically is just much more resourced and so some of the sort of state-of-the-art design features um, were evident there whereas in the rural KwaZulu Natal site they're much older clinics where one really faces those issues around um, the material infrastructure really not not enabling new ways of working or, or infection prevention and control. I mean I think I think just, I mean, in many things I could respond, but there is one thing just in relation to flow and, and congregation. I think what really 
struck me from this work was how in many ways the patients had so little power because the they, there were so many people in these clinics it was really around sort of managing crowds and the, so from the staff perspective you know just desperate to get people moving from one station of care to another but because of the lack of of queue management systems or um often these these bottlenecks the patients were actually really powerless to to actually um, move around or have or have much agency even to go and um, you know buy food or drink and they're spending long periods of of time there so um the the staff actually as always is the case had a lot of power because there was quite a um, in many cases quite a punitive attitude that if if you miss your name being called, you'll go to the back of the queue. And so people were really terrified to, to sort of leave queues. And in a way that made the observational work easier because people were there for so long. But there was also this the stress related to try and navigate that, that clinic system. And I think that sort of really relates to these broader questions around quality of care and the ideal clinic system that is trying to change some of the, these elements from the perspective of improving quality of care. And then there will be gains also for IPC. Thank you. So, Ginny, do you want to um, reflect on that? Because it, it, we had urban clinics, but urban clinics in Zambia and South Africa. So sort of a sense of, of difference around the use of space? I mean, given Haley's reflected on the rural versus the urban. Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest um, difference um, was whether you had integrated systems of HIV management or demarcated. So um, there was one um, one clinic in Zambia and I think three in South Africa where they'd integrated HIV care. So instead of going sort of on a very distinctive sort of route to access art services, you were, it was sort of one stop, which is the same quote that, that Haley used, that you would go to one place. And, and definitely that helps with uh, diminishing stigma and experiencing experiences of stigma, but it, um, it was it could be a bit challenging for the health staff as well because they weren't necessarily specialized or they weren't able to access the files and and as easily if they had a sort of separate system so i suppose that was the the biggest difference between zambia and south africa was was actually um in terms of the sort of staff speaking out so so the south african staff were much more um, likely to be very vocal about making changes and getting resources and the, the Zambian staff or participants were more sort of subdued and, and less sort of demanding of the system. I think that was the, that was sort of evident. And maybe just to kind of add, sort of go back to um, comments about actually conducting research in the clinic. So the, the research was most of the research was done, the observations and most of the initial IDIs by social scientists who were very familiar with the clinic and had spent a lot of time in that particular community and health facility. And, but on the whole, and that worked well, I think. I did one of the IDIs at the beginning, but when it stopped working well was with health workers living with HIV. So 37 of the health workers were living with HIV. And those interviews were more easily done by myself or a social scientist that wasn't based at the clinic. So I think that's an interesting example of when sometimes an outsider has, has, uh, is more appropriate. Yeah, thank you. Brekia, did you want to reflect perhaps on, this, on the space and the, um, a little more on that with your, your particularly with your midwives? Um, so I guess two reflections. One, one is that I, I really like to focus on space and it, it, during the presentations I was really thinking I think this is a, a real area where there's scope for more engagement with anthropology and other social sciences and I, yeah, I find it a very exciting thing to, to, um, to draw in more into the analysis. I guess for me in terms of so space wasn't explicit uh, an explicit focus in my studies but um, thinking about it, it certainly, of course, it, it played a role. And um, the first things which come to mind are actually in terms of ethics. 
um, the difficulty of uh, keeping some distance, not sort of uh, being too close to women during very private moments. Uh, I was, you know, I was, was sort of dancing around, find, trying to find a place where I certainly would not be in anybody's way, uh, would be minimally invasive, uh, you know, somewhere perched in the corner. But then sometimes also being asked by, by midwives, like, you know, are you afraid to see a birth? Why, why are you sitting there? Come closer. Um, things like that. So there was this, yeah, there's certainly this management of space. And I, I find also, um, yeah, interesting, I guess, how, how the midwives also use the space to uh, show their own sort of uh, boundaries. So I remember, for instance, um, of course, there was difference in, in terms of how willing midwives were for me to, to be there. Uh, and for instance, at some point, I remember a midwife coming in to a shift whom I hadn't met much yet. And, and uh, she was never so engaging with me, which I totally understand as well. And I remember that there was a, a birth going on and she just um, slammed the door closed. And I thought, like, OK, that's that's clear. I'll, I'll stay out and I'll stay away for this moment. So, yeah, they, they of course, also will use that space to show where the boundaries for you as a researcher lie. Thank you. Any more questions, Hayley? Yes, I've managed to refresh my on-air platform and um, apologies to Mary Hadley and Lauren that I hadn't seen your questions before. So Lauren War Wallace has quite an interesting question. She says, I'm wondering how the ethnographic data and methods have been perceived by policymakers and decision makers in these various contexts as useful or too slow has this data been brought into decision making fora, and what has been that? What has been that experience? I think I can see Priya smiling, and this was exactly the point I was going to raise with you, Priya. So it's perfect. So, do you want to respond, Karima? Do you want to take that? I'll I'll start, Priya, and then you can go on. Um, um, I'll speak to uh, sharing our findings sort of with our other interloc interlocutors other than the state, uh, which we haven't done to a very great extent yet. But just sharing our qualitative findings, our insights from our ethnography with partners who are perhaps more steeped in the quantitative side of, of doing research and who are very see everything in you know rich data sets and huge numbers etc and it's it's very challenging to convince people who see things from a purely quantitative mindset I'm sure as everybody on this panel will agree I'm not saying anything earth-shattering here but perhaps it's interesting for the audience to uh, convince people that these insights even if they're based on a very small number of facilities are extremely revealing and are extremely illuminating and give very uh, clear insights and explanations for why things that should be happening aren't happening or why other things, you know, why everything is happening the way it is. And as I was just saying to somebody earlier this evening, I mean, huge quantitative surveys uh, give you numbers of things that have gone up or gone down or have happened or haven't happened, but they'll, they don't tell you why. They don't tell you why these things are happening the way they are. And the only answers I feel to the why questions are come from doing what we're all doing is sitting and observing and talking to people on the ground and ask them questions and getting their viewpoints and capturing all the intangible scripts that only come by observing or participant observation, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, I guess that's a long way of saying it's a little bit of a challenge, but Priya might like to elaborate more. Um, just a little bit more. So, you know, um, and that's the question I really, we've asked ourselves through this process because uh, we, OPM is more like a management consultant firm and that got this opportunity to do ethnog clinic ethnography, which is quite a privilege and a rare thing to happen in that kind of setting. Um, and the issue, and so we were constantly conversing with people who are designing policies and interventions for this particular state and they're looking at it from a, the WHO sort of building blocks of health right and what we were sort of unraveling in terms of the no-do gaps etc were really around issues of embedded power about hierarchies about a recognition of skill sets and all of these issues which are intangible and very often encountered the question of so what, right? And we were constantly sort of being um, asked about issues about, so what is actionable? What, what of this can be actionable? Yes, power is there and um, you know values and norms are there, but it's there everywhere. What is actionable in terms of, uh, the bottom line of our findings, especially where the nurses were concerned, was that 
even under the given systemic constraints under which they were operating, just a few small changes in terms of the way they could access space within the clinical facilities, right? For example, they didn't have, a, despite being uh, spending the longest hours in the clinic, they didn't have uh, resting space. Um, um, and the fact that they never had access to clean toilets, et cetera, right? So it constant, the space constantly reinforced the subordinate positions. And yet the system was unwilling to recognize it as an actionable. So very often, although we sort of really, and we've churned out a lot of data around different relationships, accountability, management, et cetera. But the, again, we go back to that whole rational framing of what inputs, what training, what, um, you know, the, the, the building blocks approach to addressing this issue. So we've had a long battle, but the good part of the story is that constantly having hammered at these issues and informed the, uh, so we had, a, we, we were nested in a whole series of study that OPM conducted for this health system strengthening project. So what we did was very strategically use our findings to inform um, the kind of learning notes and strategies that were being put out under governance, were being put out under supply chains, information and knowledge use. So that's a way we got in, but directly consuming ethnographic data around this uh, posed a huge, uh, huge challenge, but it was deeply satisfying at the end of it. At least they acknowledged that um, gender and power issues centrally inform the non-working of many of the interventions but they didn't do anything about it yet. <laughs> Thank you. So Haley, the other question, I think we've only got four minutes, so. Can you unmute? Sorry, you can hear me now. There's a um, question from, from um, Mary Hadley that um, particularly related to, I think, some of the things Ginny has already spoken about regarding the integration of care. So Mary worked on the copper belt for some years, and she was saying that um, when ARTs became free, we considered not having clinics for HIV separate because of the stigma, but combining them. However, we're not able to do this because funding came from the US government. So she says, I was interested in the uncomfortable feeling of being in the main pharmacy um, and any thoughts on the integration of services. And she also commented on the stigma she'd observed around family planning for um, adolescents. So Serena, do you perhaps want to respond on that? Sorry, I, I was. I assumed the question was for Ginny, but um, I, I thought you might want to say. So, Ginny, go to Ginny. <laughs> um, I mean, I think I think what was interesting was that sometimes um, health facilities made adjustments themselves to address stigma, and I think we learned as much from that as we did about the relationship between stigma. <laughs> And space. So, for example, um, one Zambian clinic built a, a wall around the, H, the, the HIV art waiting area so that because the waiting area was so close to the entrance of the clinic so that people couldn't see people sitting there um, whilst kind of waiting. Um, and there were examples in, in South Africa of, of sort of making adjustments to items, for example, to help. Um, circumvent stigma. I, th I think the real problem is that that nothing was done head on to do, you know, it was all just sort of accommodating stigma and circumventing stigma rather than challenging it and say it should be okay for somebody to walk in and be seen going to the HIV clinic or um, to access services. And, and indeed, if, if people living with HIV were older and, and had been going for longer, um, sometimes they felt comfortable doing that and it was easier so who you were on that journey people found it harder at the beginning than they did as over time i think we've only got a minute left so i was just going to quickly add to that i was i was thinking more broadly um as you were speaking about the fact that clinics are uh, you know clinics of a certain time are evolving and the issue about outdoor and indoor spaces is also very fascinating because often we think 
an outdoor waiting area is much better for infection prevention control, but in fact, it's associated with a poorer quality of, 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 of health center, right? Because you want to have the gleaming, you know, the, the benches inside and, and, and so on. So um, I think that Haley's points and some of the things we've gotten through this uh, Omoya Mushle project are very much around um, the, the sort of, you know, the number of considerations that people who, who are designing clinic spaces and buildings have to take into account. Uh, we haven't even started talking about issues of, you know, the therapeutic landscape and what that entails. I think we're going to have to stop there. Uh, thank you so much for... Could I just read this? Uh, of course. The page, there's a comment from Alistair Ega saying, very much appreciative of the careful consideration of space, its use, and its boundaries and rules. So um, I think that is a, quite a strong theme. Great. So to, to everybody who was online and obviously to our panelists, a huge thank you um, for the time and effort. I've really enjoyed putting this together with Haley, and um, we hope that we can follow up maybe with some written reflections on this. Um, please do email us uh, with your own experiences of, of, of working in these settings and, and conducting ethnography. And I think I'm particularly interested in the clinic as a specific space and that whole issue of permeability. Um, but at the same time, the, the boundedness of, of how clinics function. Um, so thank you, everyone. And obviously, we will all be in touch um, very soon, I hope, and in person, I hope, and not only online. Bye-bye. Thank you, Janice, for a very excellent discussion. Thank you, thank you to Janice. Thank you. 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 Thank you.